Hi, my name is Rob McFarlane. I'm a junior faculty member here in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT, uh, and I'm going to be sharing today some of the recent research advances as well as research interests our lab has. Uh, briefly speaking, our lab is a polymer synthesis uh, and polymer composites group. We develop new methods to make materials, and we develop new ways to process those materials into functional forms. Um, I have at the bottom of the slide here a couple of the keywords that uh, summarize what our lab works in, uh, but we work primarily with nanomaterials, polymer composites, and gels. I'm going to share with you some of our recent advances that might be interesting uh, um, for, for various ILB companies. Uh, Briefly speaking, our expertise lies in controlling interactions between different material components, uh, for example, polymers and nanoparticles, or polymers and interfaces and surfaces. Um, the challenge that we typically seek to address is that in most of these composites, when you add in some sort of nanoparticulate filler, these particulate fillers uh, are randomly dispersed and will tend to aggregate uh, above a certain volume uh, uh, or weight percent. Um, the ability to improve the way these particles interact with the polymer matrix surrounding them is that uh, um, uh, ultimately this will enable uh, new types of materials uh, that will uh, be useful in a variety of different applications. Uh, we generally approach things from a materials versatile uh, strategy, meaning that we don't aim to make a single material, rather we try to make a materials synthesis method that will be broadly applicable to a wide variety of materials and different applications. In terms of the key areas of interest that we think might be relevant for various ILP companies uh, would be materials development for advanced manufacturing methods. So 3D printing of materials that have nanoparticulate uh, fillers within a polymer composite. Um, the applications of those would be things like structural materials, so materials that have high strength to weight ratios that are incredibly scratch resistant or that have the beneficial mechanical properties of a polymer while still also having some of the beneficial chemical, optical or other properties of an inorganic material. Uh, we also aim to look at materials for electromagnetic manipulation. So these would be things like displays or screens or screen coatings, uh, sensors for different stimuli or electromagnetic shielding. And lastly, uh, we have uh, the potential to use these materials for things like filtration devices, uh, materials that have high surface area to volume ratios, controlled or non-tortuous pathways, and, and uh, things like that. So there are three research, uh, um, uh, recent research areas and, and advancements that I want to present here today that I think are going to be relevant. Um, so the first is in the area of making high inorganic content polymer composites. And the challenge here is that while uh, inorganic nanoparticles can add functionality to polymers that polymers cannot have any other way, typically above five to 10 volume percent of polymer or of particle, the particles would begin to aggregate. So as you can see in the images here on the top, uh, this is a, a polymer composite that has well dispersed nanoparticles. You can see that it behaves and looks just like a, a regular transparent polymer. But if we start to add too many of those inorganic nanoparticles, they begin to aggregate. This results in uh, decreased performance, both in terms of mechanical properties, as well as uh, in terms of affecting their optical clarity. So the opportunity here is that if we can make a polymer material that has the same processability and mechanical performance of traditional polymers, but has very large amounts of inorganic nanoparticle within it, we can make a material that has uh, properties never before achievable. So this would include something like a high refractive index material that is still mechanically durable. So the way that our lab has uh, uh, tackled this challenge is by using what are called brush particles. These are nanoparticles coated with polymers where one end of the polymer chain is attached to the particle. This allows us to use these particles as single component building blocks for polymer composites. Uh, the specific advance that we've developed is a method to cross-link these particles together once we've actually processed the polymer. So the idea is we have our brush particle, uh, we process it into some sort of macroscopic form, and then once it's actually in that form, we chemically cross-link it. So it goes from being a very soft material to very rigid and stiff material uh, with just a, a simple heating process. A couple of different chemistries have been developed. 
Um, shown here are some examples of macroscopic materials that we've been able to make with this that are compatible with things like uh, compression molding, extrusion, vacuum forming, and other types of methods. They can make centimeter or multigram scale quantities. Uh, once they've actually been processed into a physical form, these materials are then thermally aged for anywhere from a few hours to a few days, depending on the actual structure. And what we end up with is now a rigid freestanding material that is mechanically robust. So this is something that is as stiff as a traditional plastic you might see in any sort of uh, um, consumer application, but it actually has as much as 60 to 65 volume percent of inorganic nanoparticle within it. So these uh, EM images on the right here are showing a cross section of these macroscopic materials. And as you can see, each of these little dots is a silicon nanoparticle. So you can see we have a material that has very, very large amounts of that inorganic content within it, but still has good mechanical properties and optical clarity. Potential applications for these materials include mechanically robust materials for optical management. So for example, shown here on the left are some cross-linked materials uh, um, compared to some non-cross-linked materials uh, that uh, show that these materials are significantly scratch resistant. So what you can see on the top electron microscopy images here on the left is a, when a microindenter is used to scratch the surface of a polymer composite material that does not have the cross-links, it is very easily scratched. However, once we actually do the cross-linking process, this material is incredibly scratch resistant. Um, however, it remains optically clear and actually has material toughness and hardness even better than the polymer alone. So this would be beneficial for something like a protective screen cover or a protective display cover, something that is optically transparent but mechanically stiff. Uh, on the right, this is a more advanced application where we can actually control the organization of particles to make materials that have photonic crystal and photonic band gap effects. These are materials that reflect different wavelengths of light depending on, on the uh, angle of, of the light incident. So the images here on the right, these are the same exact material. Um, uh, we're just shining light either from the left or from the front, and you can see that we get different uh, uh, optical appearances as a result. Um, so we envision this material being useful for protective screen covers, uh, for display technologies, or, or things like that, uh, because we can make materials that have up to 60 to 65 volume percent inorganic content. Because inorganic particles can have significantly higher refractive index, we've done a back of the envelope calculation that we could, in principle, make a material that was stronger, stiffer, and, uh, and, and better mechanically than any polymer that we might want to add, but that still has a refractive index up to about 2.2 which is significantly above what could be achieved with the polymer. The other application that we, we envision for this are materials that are high thermal conductivity, but uh, low electrical conductivity. Uh, this can be done by adding a large amount of thermally conductive inorganic material to the polymer matrix. Uh, so for example, uh, what we have here is a material that before it's cross-linked is very soft and can be easily pressed or, or uh, compression molded. Uh, but once it's actually been thermally aged, it's now significantly stiffer. Um, because we have, in this particular case, uh, up to 85 weight percent of inorganic material, we can have a material that has four times higher thermal conductivity than the polymer does alone. However, this is still completely electrically insulating. So the advantage of a material that is completely electrically insulating and still has high uh, uh, thermal conductivity and uh, good mechanical properties is as a casing or a coating or a protective material for electronic or energy storage devices. These materials produce a lot of heat when under operation that needs to be dissipated to the environment, but they also need to be protected from uh, external damage. Uh, a polymer material is great for protecting against mechanical damage and for electrical insulation, and the addition of these high uh, uh, amount of inorganic polymer or particles allows us to have a material that is also significantly thermally conductive. Uh, in principle, the methods we have developed are materials general, and so uh, they can be compatible with multiple different polymer types and multiple different particle types. Uh, so these are not the only potential applications of these materials. They're just the ones that are, are the um, most obvious for that we've begun to examine. The second research area I want to talk about is our ability to control how nanoparticles are organized within a, a composite. So if you look here on the right, uh, this is a standard method for making a, a uh, polymer nanoparticle composite where nanoparticles are mechanically blended uh, within the polymer. 
Uh, this is a very easy, very simple way to make large macroscopic quantities of material, but at the same time, it has the problem that it doesn't control how those particles are organized within the uh, polymer matrix. Um, this both uh, limits the extent to which you can control material properties um, and also prevents the addition of any sort of new properties that might arise from nanoparticles being organized. Self-assembly routes to control how particles are organized within some sort of super lattice formation have been developed, uh, such as these thin film coatings on the left, uh, more complex, uh, a small uh, a molecule or biomolecule directed assemblies, or simple uh, gravitational sedimentation approaches. Uh, can be used to generate these highly ordered arrays of nanoparticles. Uh, such arrays of nanoparticles have been shown to exhibit unique optical, magnetic, or chemical effects. Uh, but the challenge is, in order to control how these particles are organized, typically you have to change the assembly process such that you can only make very, very small structures or very, very thin films. Um, so this is not really a scalable or industrially relevant method to making ordered nanoparticle-based materials. So the second technological advancement I want to present is what we call the nanocomposite tecton, or NCT. This is a method to actually control uh, nanoparticle organization and make these ordered arrays that have potentially beneficial optical, chemical, mechanical, or other properties but they can actually be done at the uh, macroscopic length scale. These nanocomposite tectons, they're similar to the particles I showed previously, where we have an inorganic particle coated with a polymer brush. The unique wrinkle here is that we have added to this polymer brush a supramolecular binding group, basically a molecular structure at the end of the polymer chains that allows the particles to interact with one another. When particles have complementary supermolecular groups, they will link together into a larger structure. And by controlling that assembly process, we can actually make these ordered arrays of particles. What's nice about this process is that it is scalable. We can now make materials that are on the centimeter or larger length scales, either by making materials entirely out of the NCTs themselves, or by taking a traditional plastic or polymer and embedding these NCT crystallites within them. Uh, because of the methods that we use, these materials are highly programmable in terms of their structure at either the compositional level, so the uh, types of polymers or the types of particles, at the nanoscale level in terms of how the particles are organized relative to one another, and in terms of the micro and macro structure, in terms of the ability to make these uh, ordered arrays uh, uh, at the macroscopic length scale. It is also uh, uh, incredibly versatile in terms of the different assembly conditions, and it is readily processable, meaning that we can actually integrate these materials into uh, pre-existing processing pathways for, for traditional plastics. Um, in short, they can be made into a wide variety of different materials, all while retaining the nanoscale organization of particles that can induce uh, new optical, chemical, magnetic, or other effects. Uh, potential applications for these materials would be feed feedstocks for 3D printing, where if the uh, particular optical or chemical or other effect uh, induced by nanoparticle organization is beneficial, we can add it into a standard 3D printer. Uh, potential applications for those would be things like photonic sensors, uh, flexible LED displays or batteries, uh, self-healing coatings, or stimuli responsive adhesives. The last research area I want to talk about uh, does not involve particles. It's a polymer only material, but this is a method of making a non-swelling rapid forming hydrogel. So uh, polymer hydrogels are uh, generally very beneficial for biomedical applications because they can possess, possess both mechanical and chemical properties similar to human tissues. Um, the challenge is that if you want those uh, good mechanical properties that makes them robust, uh, they generally require high polymer content. Additionally, uh, polymers, uh, uh, polymer gels, when placed into a hydrogen environment, like being placed in contact with tissue, tend to swell or fall apart. And this is obviously very bad if they're going to be interacting with uh, the human body. The opportunity here is that if we had a material that could be um, put into the human body that would uh, uh, have those mechanical properties without having to have a large amount of polymer content, we could potentially have a material that is useful for uh, long-term and sustained drug delivery uh, or for uh, uh, interfacing different bio implants, uh, you know, making a coating that can uh, probably prevent uh, um, negative interactions with the human tissue. Um, and if we can make these materials so that they actually can be injected, so in other words, they're rapidly forming so they can be injected as a liquid solution and they gel within the human body, they could be used for things like uh, artificial cartilage replacements. 
So the material that we've developed uh, is what's called a bottle brush polymer. Um, so this is a polymer shown here in orange, where coming off of a backbone are multiple other short polymer chains. And at the ends of those polymer chains, we put uh, uh, cross-linking groups that can form covalent bonds. Once we actually take these two different polymer types that have these complementary cross-linking groups uh, and we introduce them to one another, they very rapidly form this networked gel architecture. The particular advantage of these brush polymer gel based gels, number one, they are stiffer uh, and stronger than comparable gels made with standard polymers. So a common way to make a, a polymer based gel is with a, a, a tetravalent uh, polyethylene glycol molecule. With our polyethylene glycol brush polymers, we can use the same amount of polymer and increase the stiffness by an order of magnitude or more. We can also make materials that have very, very low polymer content. So this is a, a gel that is freestanding, but it has less than 1% uh, of polymer content within it. This is a, a very ideal for uh, um, bio implanting applications. Uh, the other advantage is that these materials gel incredibly rapidly. So if again, we go back to this common tetrapeg, you can see that it only gels here after uh, uh, about uh, uh, 15 minutes or so. Comparably, our uh, bottle brush gels can gel within just a few seconds, such that we can either write them on a vertical surface, or we can actually even um, 3D print them into a solution. Moreover, once we've actually uh, uh, made them and put them into a hydrated environment, these materials do not swell. So this is a bottle brush polymer here on top, and this is a traditional gel on bottom after it being ex exposed to different amounts of water. You can see that on the top, all of these gels made with the bottle brush polymer when exposed to water only swell slightly, um, depending on the amount of water exposure, whereas a traditional gel very rapidly falls apart uh, into a, a, a viscous liquid. So as a result of these beneficial properties, these bottle brush materials are, are potentially beneficial for things like non-swelling drug delivery devices, where we can inject the material into the human body. Uh, and because it doesn't swell, it doesn't put any pressure on nearby tissues. Uh, these would be beneficial for steady release rate of proteins, vaccines, or gene therapy uh, 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 materials. Uh, because they rapidly form, they can be 3D printed for tissue engineering materials. So these materials would have the mechanical or chemical properties of a traditional hydrogel, but they can actually be 3D printed into a form that could be used to form artificial tissue scaffolds. And lastly, we can use these materials as coatings for other types of structures, so implants or other types of devices that need to be put into the human body where you don't want an inflammatory response. These materials can be used as coatings to prevent the, the um, uh, body from uh, having negative interactions with those materials. In terms of the overall where our McFarlane lab is and our interest in uh, working with ILP partners, um, we have multiple active research areas uh, and we're looking for industry partners that want to uh, use and help us develop our technology. Um, we are primarily focused on synthesizing new materials and measuring their properties and we're interested in collaborating with uh, ILP partners to take those uh, materials to the next stage of actually making some functional devices or putting them into commercial use. Um, so these are the research areas that our lab is engaged in. We have a third research area based on uh, DNA programmed particle assembly that I did not talk about and I'm happy to answer any questions on. But primarily uh, the uh, projects of interest for ILP companies here are going to lie in the areas of nanocomposite assembly and processing, high inorganic content composites, and nanostructured hydrogels. Uh, thank you. <laughs>